Great. So we are very glad to have Hunter speak, coming all the way from Stanford, who's going to tell us about a new term character for classical new type common parts. Great. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Ravi. Um, so today, uh, what I want to do, as uh, Ravi said, is talk about a new turn character for Lee Combinatorics. Uh, this is joint work with Chris Err, Alex Fink, and um, Matt Larson, who is uh, still a graduate student here at uh, Stanford. Okay. So what I want to do, basically, is walk you through an entire computation using Herzebrook Riemann Rock right from the beginning. It's going to be really easy. It's going to be about 40 minutes. And at some point, there's going to be a weird isomorphism that comes up. And we're going to try and make that isomorphism look nicer in the particular case that we're um, working with. So what are churn characters? So churn characters, these things here, these are things that relate to different uh, algebraic invariants of, a of, a, of an algebraic variety. Um, they relate something called K-theory, which um, encodes the study of vector bundles. It's a ring which has a direct sum of vector bundles and tensor product of vector bundles as sum and product. There's some relations between these vector bundles corresponding to short exact sequences. This is just a nice ring you can study and you can um, take Euler characteristics in this, um, in, in, in this ring and it's a very useful computational tool. And on the other hand, we have this thing called cohomology. So cohomology is a ring you can associate to really any topological space at all. Um, and uh, if I multiply elements in cohomology together, uh, this is the same as intersecting uh, sub varieties of your um, underlying variety X. And ultimately it allows you to compute how many points of intersection when you do generic intersections. So apparently there's a way to relate vector bundle computations and Euler characteristics with um, intersecting, um, intersecting things like in the algebraic topology sense. And this is uh, the connection is through this thing called the churn character. And what I'm going to propose is that if your object comes from a Lie type situation, there might be a better way to relate it from a computational point of view. Um, so let's get started. So what, what I have to do is um, I have to work with a, a specific class of varieties. And I wanna work with a class of varieties where we can compute the K theory and the cohomology rings completely explicitly 100% so that you don't need to do any geometry you just, you just get these rings and you can work with all the elements just hands-on, no complicated subtleties. <clears throat> so the setup is this. We're going to look at varieties which have what's called a torus action. So I'm going to take my torus to be the complex numbers without zero to the N. So these are like diagonal um, N by N matrices. And uh, some varieties come equipped with a natural action of a torus. And we'll see a lot of examples of it, but in particular, uh, flag varieties, toric varieties, these are all things which you can naturally have a torus act on. So this theory applies. And uh, we're going to assume that we're working with smooth projective varieties. So I don't have to remember what the hypotheses are on my theorem. <clears throat> and uh, we only need two things. We need this torus has an action. So there's actually some torus action um, on our variety X. And we're going to assume for the purposes of making the computation simple that the fixed point set of X under this torus action is finite. So for example, if we have projective space, which are N tuples of coordinates up to scaling, not all of which are zero, we can have the torus act in this very obvious way where you have the torus element acting on your homogeneous coordinates and it just scales all of the homogeneous coordinates. This is a well-defined torus action, so projective space will naturally fit into this um, framework. So GKM theory, Goretz- So, so mm -hmm. Mr. Projective space, could you, could you just remind us what the fixed points are? Uh, well, I'm actually going to compute it explicitly for projective. Oh, great. But it will, it will be a finite set of fixed points, I promise. Um, so GKM theory, standing for Goreski, Kotswick, and McPherson, 
uh, they created a refinement of the Atiyabot localization formula, which allows us to describe not just what intersection computations are in these rings, but actually allows us to describe exactly what these rings are in terms of really, really simple combinatorial data. So we're going to do this for projective space. I wrote out some steps and then I'm, you know, I'm not going to, uh, um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to describe each of these steps by one by one, but I'm just going to say this is a strengthening of a uh, situation that appears in much more generality whenever I have just like a smooth manifold with a torus action. But because we're in this algebraic setting, we can be a little bit more specific about these rings. So uh, here's how this works. The input, so we have this variety, and I'm just going to create a graph out of this variety that's going to encode every piece of information that I need to do all computations in K-theory and cohomology. Uh, and the graph is uh, done as follows. First, we're going to find the fixed points. So let's, for example, figure out the fixed points of projective space under this torus action. Um, does anyone know what the fixed points of projective space are under this torus action? One non-zero coordinate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exactly right. So if there are two or more non-zero coordinates, this T action actually changes the point. But if there's exactly one non-zero coordinate, then the T action, even though it scales the coordinate, uh, because we're in projective space, that ends up being the same point. So the fixed points, very easy to describe. They are, uh, let's call them P1 through Pn. Uh, and these correspond, I guess, to the standard basis vectors up to scale. So exactly one non-zero coordinate. Okay, so really easy to describe these. Next, so these are gonna be the vertices. So these things here are going to be the vertices. So we have an N vertex graph, and I have to tell you about the edges. So first I'm going to compute locally what the edges look like at each of these uh, vertices. So to do this, I take one of my vertices and I look at the tangent space to that fixed point of my variety. In this case, the tangent space to PI of P to the N minus one. Now this torus is moving around projective space. So it's mapping some tangent spaces to some other tangent spaces. But if I look at the tangent space of a fixed point, it maps it to the tangent space at that fixed point. So the torus actually acts on this tangent space. It, it acts by endomorphisms of this tangent space. And we can describe this action on the tangent space by computing uh, what are called the weights of the representation. So we're going to take this vector space with the T action. We're gonna break it up into one dimensional subspaces on which T acts. So uh, let's do this. So I'm going to compute this tangent space in a chart, uh, xi equals one. So in this chart, we uh, just rescale everything back by xi. The xi coordinate becomes one. Uh, I guess we start at one uh, over xi. Okay. And this chart is actually isomorphic to affine n space by literally just forgetting this coordinate here. You get n coordinates now no longer up to scaling because this one anchors the scaling. Oh, so, n minus one with your conventions. Uh, a n minus, uh, a -N minus one, that is correct. A n minus one, that is correct and important, so that's good. And under this map, pi, gets mapped to zero. So uh, locally what the situation looks like is I have this vector space, a to the n minus one, this torus is scaling each of the coordinates by these amounts, and we want to understand the tangent space of the origin. Well, okay, but it's a vector space, so obviously this is just like I'm asking like the, the tangent space, the action of this torus on the tangent space of the origin is just the action of the torus on the ambient vector space. So really these things here uh, correspond to what are called the, uh, the, uh, the, the weights of this action. And they produce these things called characters. So a character is a linear representation 
of how the torus is acting on each of the one dimensional subspaces. So here I claim that the characters, um, EI plus one minus EI, EN minus EI inside Z to the N, these elements of Z to the N are encoding how the torus is scaling each of these um, coordinates. So I just did the obvious encoding of like XI goes to the standard basis vector, XI squared would go to twice the I standard basis vector. So this is a linear way of representing how the torus is acting on each of these um, on each of these coordinates. Um, and uh, great, so we have these characters. And let me actually specialize now to um, uh, to n equals three, so projective two space, so I can actually draw a picture of what's going on. So let's do n equals three. So I have three fixed points, p1, p2, and p3. And what I'm going to do is I'm saying, well, the local picture of this graph at each of these um, at each of these fixed points. So I'm building up the graph slowly. Um, we have edges which look like this: e3 minus e1. E1 minus E3, E2 minus E3, E3 minus E2, and E1 minus E2. Okay, so I just put these, I just label some outgoing edges with these uh, characters for each of the fixed points. Not yet a graph, I've just described a bunch of vertices with some edges emanating out, but now I need to like join them up to create a graph. So here comes step three, the joining up step. Um, in order to join two of these edges together, we're going to join two fixed points together if they're connected by an invariant P1. So an invariant P1, so a setwise invariant P1 under this torus action, <clears throat> uh, these connect some pairs of fixed points. So just like we have torus fixed points, we also have torus fixed P1s. There are, some, there are going to be some torus fixed P1s in this graph in uh, projective space. We're going to use those to like join up this graph. So it turns out in uh, P2 that the torus uh, fixed uh, P1s are pretty easy to describe. Just like the torus fixed points are where exactly one non-zero coordinate, uh, one coordinate is non-zero the P1s are going to correspond to where two of the coordinates are non-zero. So zero, B, C, and A, zero, C. Okay, so in the case of P to the two, these three P1s join up this graph like this. And in general, uh, for P to the N, I guess it would look like some kind of, uh, it would look like N points with a pair of, uh, with, with every uh, edge. Of it. So it'd be like a complete graph. So this is a complete graph, complete graph K3, um, which I guess is colloquially known as a triangle. <laughs> Great, so we have this triangle and the edges of this graph are labeled, well, they're labeled twice, I guess. You notice here, this was labeled E2 minus E1, but this was labeled E1 minus E2. This isn't a coincidence in general when we join these things up. An edge emanating with a certain character is going to join up to another edge emanating with the opposite, with the, the negated character. So I can think of the edges as being labeled by plus or minus some characters. It actually doesn't matter which one you take. So I'm just going to say that uh, we have a labeling, which I'm going to call chi, three minus C one, and uh, chi of two, three is plus or minus E2 minus E3. Okay, so I have a graph labeled with plus or minus some characters that I derived from my variety. And this is all the information that I need to compute the K theory and the cohomology ring of the variety. Okay, so this was step one. So step one, we made the GKM graph. So GKM graph, tick, it's a triangle. So is it a special feature of this situation that a character or its negative only appears once? Um, the special feature of this situation, 
uh, that a character, like for example, that E2 minus E1 only appeared once. Yeah. Yeah, that's um, the, the hypotheses on X are going to make it so that the uh so that this so that you don't have repeated um so that you don't have repeated um characters coming out of the right. um i mean now you mean repeated coming out of the same bird characters. you can have the same coming out of the same yeah i mean you could just double for instance you could have two copies of projective space with the torus action right yeah, yeah. so I, I did say smooth projective i guess the smoothness Sorry, what? I think that was an accidental. Uh, okay, let me just say, there exists some hypotheses, which I believe are smooth and projective, that make this thing work exactly like this. So unless you're really trying to create a variety that's crazy, this is, this is, this is the way the theory works. Um, okay, so we have, we have projective space, I made this graph. This graph is nice, it's labeled by things. So now I'm going to take this graph and I'm going to use it to compute the K theory and the cohomology. So here are the formulas for computing the K theory, and sorry, this should be FW, and the cohomology. So this is some complicated looking formula. Let me describe what it is in really simple terms. So the K theory is going to look like a triple of Laurent polynomials. So we look at all triples of Laurent polynomials, F2, T2, T3, F3, T1, T2, T3. We're gonna look at all triples of Laurent polynomials, which have the property that these two things are congruent mod one minus T1, T3 to the minus one. These two are congruent mod one minus T3, T2 to the minus one. And these are congruent mod one minus T1, T2 to the minus one. Okay. So these things here came from the edge labels here, here, and here. So I'm looking at triples of Laurent polynomials. So I'm looking at a sub ring of this direct sum of Laurent polynomial rings that satisfy these compatibility conditions. And this gives me equivariant K-theory, T-equivariant K-theory. T-equivariant cohomology is going to be very similar. We're going to look at triples, this time of polynomials, F2 of T1, uh, so this F3, T2, T3, and we have F2 of T1, T2, T3. Except now we have polynomials with uh, additive modularity conditions. So I take each of these characters and I write down a condition which looks like this in the special case, T1 minus T3. And these are congruent mod T2 minus T3. Right. So given the labeling of the edge, you can create this uh, condition that's one minus this character written multiplicatively. And these relate Laurent polynomials, and this gives K theory. And you can take this, um, this edge label and you can write it additively. And then you uh, take these, uh, I guess in this case, triples of polynomials where these two polynomials are related modulo, in this case, T1 minus T2. Okay, does anyone have questions about what the description of these rings is based on what I said? Like to go from this data to, to, um, to these rings, any questions? Because this is important. So you haven't told us what um, equivariant K-theory is, um, and I'm guessing the other guy is equivariant cohomology or something like that. Are, are you going to tell us? Yes. Okay. No. It doesn't matter what they are, because I'm just going to tell you how to go from the equivariant K-theory and the equivariant cohomology to the usual K-theory and cohomology. So it doesn't matter what these things are. It just turns out that there's, um, 
Uh, there's just a process for going from this equivariant object to the non-equivariant object. Basically, the equivariant K theory keeps track of T equivariant vector bundles, and the equivariant cohomology keeps track of T equivariant cycles that you can create in some way, also usually from vector bundles, ironically. Um, but no matter, we have these, uh, we have these rings. And uh, in order to create the non-equivariant versions, uh, what we do, um, well, actually, let me compute these for a uh, projective space. And then, um, I mean, let me write, write down in words what I just did for projective space. And then um, let me uh, describe the process of going from the equivariant ring to the non-equivariant ring. So um, in words, this equivariant ring consists of triples, F1, F2, and F3 where F1 minus F2 is zero mod one minus T1, T2 inverse. F1 minus F3 is zero mod one minus T1, T3 inverse. And F2 minus F3 is zero mod one minus T2, T3 inverse. And then the cohomology ring is going to be the same thing except with polynomials. Three where one minus F2 is zero mod T1 minus T2, one minus F3 is zero mod T1 minus T3, and F2 minus F3 is zero mod T2 minus T3. So we have this, we have these two rings. And uh, before I reduce them down to their non-equivariant counterparts, um, I actually want to give uh, descriptions of these rings in a slightly more aesthetic way. So it's going to be obvious how the uh, resulting quotienting operation works. So I'm going to identify a particular element um, over here on the K-theory side that I'm going to call X. This is going to be the uh, class of the line bundle O of one with some appropriate polarization. And it's going to correspond to the triple big T1, big T2, and big T3. So these big T1, big T2, and big T3, uh, these are the characters of the torus on the fibers of this line bundle over each of these fixed points, uh, written multiplicatively, multiplicatively. Fortunately, these characters are simple enough that writing it multiplicatively, I don't even have to multiply anything together since they're literally just T1, T2, and T3. Um, similarly, on the cohomology side, I'm going to identify a particularly nice class, which is the first turn class of this line bundle that I'm going to call H. And this is going to be T1, T2, and T3. So this is exactly the same process, except you write it additively. And again, fortunately or coincidentally, writing these things additively and multiplicatively is the same because these characters are just so easy. Uh, to write down. So with these particular elements, the equivariant K theory of P2, you can show purely combinatorially. There's nothing to do with, um, uh, with uh, you know, geometry. I can just go, I have this description of this ring and I can show that every element can be identified with an element of the following ring. So I claim it's generated by the constant assignments, big T1, big T2, big T3, and its inverses. So these are going to represent the constant assignments to each of the vertices. Together with X, this thing which does a different thing to each of the vertices, modulo the obvious relation that if I take something which has zero in the first coordinate, and I multiply it together with something which has zero in the second coordinate, and I multiply it together with something which is zero in the third coordinate, then this is zero. So I quotient out by this relation, and it turns out that these rings are actually, um, this, this, this is a description of this ring in terms of generators and relations. And similarly, the T equivariant cohomology of P2 is going to be the same thing, except we're going to use polynomials. We're going to adjoin H, and we're going to do the same trick, H minus T1 h minus t2 and h minus t3. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you how to go from the 
equivariant thing to the non-equivariant thing. We set the constant assignments to be one here. And over here, we set the constant assignments to be zero. So in this description, this is rather easy to do. So we get the usual K theory is Z adjoint X modulo X minus one cubed. And the usual cohomology is Z adjoint H modulo H cubed, which if you go on Wikipedia, you can check like I did, agrees with what Wikipedia says, which, uh, which I think means that the calculation probably worked out. <clears throat> okay. So this X minus one and this H actually have significance in that X minus one, so let me say geometrically why this is, um, why these relations hold. So this is the structure sheaf of a hyperplane is, is X minus one in the K room. And it turns out that when you multiply structure sheaves of uh, varieties together, you get the intersection plus some higher order terms. And similarly over here in um, a projective space, this H is uh, the uh, point grade dual to the class of a hyperplane. And when I intersect, um, uh, when I multiply H a bunch of times, it's the same as intersecting a bunch of generic hyperplanes. So these relations are literally just saying when I intersect three generic hyperplanes, I get the empty set. They're just saying it in two different contexts. So here I said K theory involved vector bundles. And I guess I wrote down a coherent sheaf here, but there um, you can write the coherent sheaf in a short exact sequence involving vector bundles. Um, okay, so we have this relation, we have this relation, and now comes the most important part of this uh, talk, which is the fundamental question. So question, how do we relate K theory and cohomology? Um, more precisely, is there something resembling maybe, I don't know, a ring homomorphism between K theory and cohomology. Because that'd be really useful because then I could take information about vector bundles and then turn it into information about um, intersections and vice versa. So I can um, compare two different algebraic invariants in a very simple way. So uh, let me just throw this out there. Um, is there a natural ring homomorphism between these two rings? Ideally an isomorphism, that would be great. I think so. Okay, Ravi thinks so. But does anyone else think so? Maybe someone that doesn't do algebraic geometry, just like a pure, we have these two rings. Are they isomorphic? And if so, what is the isomorphism? I think you came to the wrong seminar to look at an algebraic geometry. Okay, how about anyone other than Ravi who knows the answer? Well, because he saw this talk before, so that's cheating. I think we'll put this question on the quals next week. This is great. So Z join X mod X minus one cubed. I asked you guys more to Z mod H mod H cubed. Okay. I am not going to continue until someone answers. <laughs> Wait, sorry. I'm a little confused as to the question. I, for a second, I thought, would it be nice if we had an isomorphism? Like that was the question, but are you just asking for an isomorphism between these two rings? No, please. Oh man, it's tricky, man. <laughs> Maybe the one taking X minus one to H. <laughs> right. Okay. Okay, so, right. The, the question, I hope, the feeling was the question felt so stupid that I would ask this uh, because it feels like, yeah, we're going to take this thing whose cube is zero, map it to this other thing uh, 
whose cube is zero. So wouldn't it be nice if the isomorphism that we're all looking at is the one that takes x minus one to h, or in other words, takes x to h plus one. Whoa, it's floating. <laughs> okay. Um, and maybe, would you believe maybe, it? Maybe, maybe to, to make this question even more interesting, I guess for a general variety, K theory and cohomology rings are not isomorphic. So really some, right? So something unusual. Right, so there's, yeah. So I wanna make a really important note about this. So I wrote down some isomorphism. This is not the churn character isomorphism. The churn character isomorphism is a crazy thing that always works. So it's terrible, but it always works. But in my particular situation, I just is a really obvious map and it, um, and it, uh, it turns out that the Turing character map is different. But the Turing character map is not over the integers. This was the uh, integer. Yes, so let me, let me clarify. So I'm gonna tell you what the Turing character map is. So boom. The Turing character map is the thing which does the following thing. Uh, so I'm gonna tell you what it does on the uh, equivariant side. So what it does to this GKM data. And I'm going to tell you what it does to just line bundles, because then that allows us to compute what it does not cover. So what you do is you take each of your um, uh, Laurent polynomial assignments, and you replace each of the big T's with E to the little t. And it turns out this has the effect of taking the class of a line bundle to X of the line bundle. Well, X of the first turn class of the line bundle. But we have to make a concession. We have to work over Q. And we have to work over Q because these denominators show up. So for example, what is the, um, well, first of all, let me just do a sanity check that these compatibility conditions are preserved after doing this, um, after doing this uh, replacement. So let's just sanity check that under this GKM description, this uh, turn character map, um, so to be clear, the turn character map always exists. And for GKM manifolds, it's just incredibly explicit to write down. And it always has this property, even if you're not a GKM manifold. This is like the characterizing property of the turn character map. Um, but let's just check that this crazy thing we did where you replace each of the big T's with either the little t uh, did something, uh, didn't break our compatibilities. So for example, we had a condition that said F1 of this was congruent to F2 of this when t1, t2 to the minus one was equal to one. So that was our modularity condition between two of the edges in the K-theory graph. When I do this replacement, we have this. e to the t3 is congruent to f2 of e to the t1, e to the t2, e to the t3. When e to the t1 minus t2 is equal to one, or in other words, when t1 minus t2 is equal to zero. Look how the exponential map turned the multiplicative condition into an additive condition. So proof the turn character map um, gives, in, gives a, gives a well-defined homomorphism by example that it takes one compatibility condition to the other compatibility condition. Not necessarily obvious it's an isomorphism, but it turns out you can define logarithm to just go backwards. So it's pretty easy to show us an isomorphism with this description. Um, so what does it do to these non-equivariant uh, rings? So the usual K-theory and homology. So here is my lovely K-ring of P2. And here is my lovely K-ring uh, my uh, cohomology ring of P2 with uh, Q coefficients, Q coefficients. Um, so we have this turn character map. And what does it do? It takes X and it maps it to one plus H plus, okay, H squared over two. That H squared over two is kind of annoying. So it took X minus one, the class of this hyperplane, and it mapped it to, H, the Poincaré dual of the hyperplane, plus something else. That's kind of annoying. 
you know, well, what can you do? This is this is the map that algebraic geometers have given us. So this is uh, this is an isomorphism. This is called the Turing character isomorphism, and uh, there's two module maps to Q, which are super important on the K theory side and the cohomology side. On the K theory side, we have something called Euler characteristic. So you can take a vector bundle and take its Euler characteristic. And on the cohomology side, you can take degree. So if you have a finite union of points, it counts the number of points. And if you have higher degree things, it, um, um, higher dimension things, it uh, kills it. So we have these two, um, we have these two extremely natural module maps to uh, Q. And we can ask, does this diagram commute? Um, so let's figure out if it commutes. So let me take an element on the, uh, in K theory and figure out what the Euler characteristic is and then figure out what this is and see if they agree. So, okay, so on the K theory side, if I take the Euler characteristic of X to the I, Turns out for very general reasons, this is going to be I plus one times I plus two over two, which is the number of lattice points in the convex hull of IE1, IE2, and IE3 inside R to the three. And this is because P2 is a toric variety, toric variety, for the triangle, which is the convex hull of E1, E2, and E3. Basically, because of the description of the torus I had on P to the two from before, you can extract this information that this Euler characteristic, if you take X to the I over here, you can P this Euler characteristic, you get this number. It counts some number of lattice points, right? Let's see what it is on the, uh, let's see what happens if I take X to the I, and I go this way. So first of all, what does degree do? Well, degree takes one and H to zero because they're not of high enough, uh, they don't correspond to things of uh, low enough dimension. And it takes H squared, or I guess for the purposes of parallelism, IH squared to I squared. So this is just a weird way of me saying that H squared integrates to one. So this is, the normalized volume under some normalization that you can write down of the convex hull of IE1, IE2, and IE3. You have to like normalize with respect to the lattice that contains these points, and then you have to multiply by some factorial, but you get I squared. Okay, so this diagram commuting would mean that this is equal to um, X, uh, well, the churn character applied to X to the I. So on the left, we have I plus one times I plus two over two. And on the right-hand side, we have the integral of one plus I H plus, well, we have a uh, X of um, I H which is um, one plus I H plus I H squared, which is I squared. So we're sad. This doesn't, uh, these, these two aren't equal to each other. So this is a non-commutative diagram. This does not commute, does not commute. So the herzebrook riemann rock theorem is a theorem which fixes the fact that this diagram doesn't commute. Because if you just like go both ways, one way gives you this quantity, one way gives you this quantity. And morally, the reason why it's not commuting is because going this way did a volume computation and going this way did a lattice point counting computation and counting the number of lattice points inside something is not the same as computing its volume. But it turns out that we can fix this or Herzebrook, Riemann and Rock fixed it. And they said, well, it turns out that if before taking the degree, I multiply 
by some fixed class called the Todd class, this actually does commute. So chi of anything is equal to the integral of some fixed thing times the term. So in other words, you can do a lattice point computation uh, by doing a volume computation that's been slightly modified by multiplying on a specific prefactor. And Wait, so, you're, so you're telling me, I have to digest this, you're telling me something that I feel like I should have known a long time ago, which is that I did not, which is that the, uh, I have a huge polytope, integral polytope, and I, uh, the higher dimensional Pick's theorem, really I can make that statement correct. Yes. I see Ravi's frozen, but yes, it says basically that you can compute the number of lattice points inside a polytope by doing a certain volume theoretic computation. So it is just a direct higher dimensional Pick's theorem. And this correction factor, is just some random thing. One plus three halves H plus H squared. This is called the Todd class. And we can see that if I do um, this computation again, h plus h squared times uh, 1 plus ih plus ih squared. So this integral picks out the h squared coefficient of the product. And this is exactly designed to make it so that you get, you get one plus three halves i plus, uh, plus uh, oh, this was over two, plus, uh, uh, plus i squared over two. So this is just like, Literally, it, you just figure out what this is by saying it has to make this formula work. So you just get some random polynomial here. And when I say it's a random polynomial, maybe I can justify that a little bit. This random polynomial here, this correction factor that you get, this is h over one minus e to the minus h to the uh, three, so this is, uh, we're in P2. So this three is coming from the fact that it's P to the two. So in general for P to the N minus one, it's going to be H over one minus E to the minus H to the N, which is really ugly. Like this is just, this is just what it has to be to make the formula work. This isn't a nice thing. This is not, the, the, this is not telling you anything geometrically about simplices. This is telling you that a binomial coefficient can be written in this explicit linear combination of powers of i. And you can understand why this would be horrible because in general, so for higher dimensions, this is going to be some like larger binomial coefficient. And when I expand it out and try and write it in this basis, it's going to have uh, like weird sterling numbers coming in to the coefficients. So, you know, you're gonna get a horrible correction factor because the coefficients of this in this basis are atrocious. <laughs> um, but let's now try and do it using our new churn character map. New churn character map. Uh, let's do the same picture. So let's not be silly and introduce this extra h squared because that was just creating a bunch of nightmares. Let's just do the obvious thing. Set a join h mod h cubed. Let's take x to one plus h, or in other words, x minus one, the structure sheaf of the hyperplane to the class of the hyperplane. So let's just do what we wanted to do and try and make a diagram that can do this. Uh, so this will be z. Z, and also I don't have to tensor with Q because I don't have any denominators. So, you know, let's 
let, let, let's see if we can mimic the Herzberg Riemann Rock theory. Um, so hopefully there's a new taught class, hopefully. It's actually not formal that there would be a new taught class. Hopefully there's a new taught class. Let's see what it would have to be. So with this picture, I want I plus one times I plus two over two, which I'll tell you is I plus two twos two, to equal the integral of, so instead of X, we're now going to use one plus H in this uh, same setup. So we're going to have one plus H to the I. So this here is replacing uh, X of I H. So this is, um, this is instead of X of I H. So we're going to have a different, uh, we're going to have this, uh, so this is, I guess, the new churn character applied to X to the I. And we want to figure out whether there's some correction factor we can put in here to give us the correct answer. And it turns out there is. So we want, we want a new Todd class. And we want to figure out whether we can put in a correction factor. And we can. One plus H squared. And the reason is that the binomial theorem tells you that one plus H to the I plus two is going to be one plus I plus two choose one H plus I plus two choose two H squared. And this is what we want. So it's much easier in the binomial basis to correct this expression to give you a binomial coefficient. So in general for projective space, so for P to the N minus one, the new Todd class is going to be one plus H to the N minus one. So it doesn't involve any E to the whatever's and it doesn't involve anything. It's just this, um, this, uh, this expression here corrects this diagram to make it commute. So why was I able to correct this diagram? So what's happening? Why was I able to replace X, which was uh, what was used in the churn character with uh, one plus H? Well, there's a coincidence in the following logic. So remember X was used to turn this condition into this condition. So we had to start here and here. And when we use X, it automatically did but we can do something different. We can notice that this condition is the same as saying that T1 is equal to T2. So what if instead of X, I just took each of these TIs and mapped it to one plus little TI? Then I would get one plus T1 uh, is equal to one plus T2. And I get T1 equals T2. So actually, we could use any power series, power series, which went one plus dot dot dot, and it would have worked out instead of X. It's just X was this natural one that always worked. Here, the fact we were able to do this is extremely particular to the fact that this is T1, T2 inverse, and this was T1 minus T2. So, this, um, so this is extremely particular, particular to one minus T1, T2 inverse, and, well, Ti, Tj inverse in general, and Ti minus Tj. Um, and these, if you remember, they came from the fact that the characters were of the form Ei minus Ej. All of the characters that I computed we're of the form EI minus EJ. So when does this happen? It turns out it happens whenever you have any construction, which is vaguely of quote type A in any sense, you always get these characters of the form EI minus EJ. So you can always get this new Herzberg Riemann rock where the map between K theory and cohomology 
is given by a much simpler substitution that doesn't introduce extraneous terms in higher degrees. It's actually very easy to translate computations. This Todd class, I didn't write down what it was, but it's always easy to compute. And this applies, for example, to flag varieties. So here we have the diagonal torus acting here. This applies to uh, toric varieties, varieties um, associated to matroid polytopes. So this has had connections to the recent work of Jun Ha on log concavity results and previous work of Fink and Spire computing tut polynomials. This really simple idea connects K-theory and cohomology in the sense that everyone that was working on K-theory were doing computations. Everyone that was working on cohomology was doing computations. And if you use the usual churn character, none of these computations are related. If you use the simpler churn character, and they all just match up to each other perfectly. Um, so you have this. And recently I found out from my collaborator, Matt Larson, that M0 N bar is close enough to something in type A that you can also make this work. So you get an integral isomorphism from the K ring to the Chow ring for M0 N bar, which is great. I mean, I actually, apparently it wasn't known that these were integrally isomorphic and the simple isomorphism it allow you you can you can do the same trick to m0 n bar although this isn't this doesn't have a torus action you have to be a little bit careful but the the same ideas let you do basically the same thing to get this isomorphism so I, i've got two related questions here one is why are you calling it type a i i can sort of see it but i'm not completely why are you calling m0 n bar type a no, no, not that well yes actually yes but also just more generally why are you calling this so you have a uh, so this family uh, of cases and you're saying and you decided that this deserves a name type a ah okay so yeah let me explain that okay. so the type a so where it's coming from is the type a hyperplane arrangement arrangement is all things of the form xi equals xj it's all of these hyperplanes and ei minus ej are the normal vectors to these hyperplanes. So it turns out that because these are the normal vectors to these hyperplanes, these objects that are created, uh, for example, uh, like these flag varieties, the fact that these are the normals to the hyperplanes turns out to force the uh, characters to all be of the form EI minus EJ. So you get an exceptional isomorphism for these things, for these things, M0 N bar is a little trickier. It turns out it's a linear space inside one of these things. So the same theory applies. And in GLN mod P, so I want to point out something about GLN mod P that, uh, well, actually, let's take GLN mod B. We have these things called uh, Schubert varieties inside GLN mod B. Under the new churn character isomorphism, this maps to something called the growth in Deke polynomial, which was previously constructed in a completely ad hoc way. And you can say, well, this new churn character was also created in an ad hoc way. Um, but if you use the original churn character, you just get total garbage. So somehow the idea of this new churn character was um, like people had, uh, people had taken the formula for this, mucked around with it non-equivariantly, and just produced a nice formula, which they called the growth indique polynomial. And this is actually just what you get when you apply our new churn character to the Schubert variety, because it's growth indique polynomial. Um, so, um, you know, I do not know where this comes from geometrically, to be clear. I really cannot give a geometric description of where this is coming from but it seems like it's the combinatorially correct thing to do in every case. It seems like the exponential map just always makes the formulas work in a worse way than doing the simpler thing of replacing it with one plus T. So in the last three minutes, I wanna tell you about um, some new things that you can do in other types as well. So this is actually the new work that I was um, going to advertise, but I guess I mostly just talked about this old work. So in types B, C, and D, 
The only difference is that the hyperplane arrangements associated to them have more hyperplanes. And the normal vectors are all of the form EI, EI minus EJ, and EI plus EJ. And it turns out if you write down what the, if, if you wanted to use something other than X in this formula, you wrote down all the conditions you needed. It turns out that you can use any function F of T, which has the property that F of T is equal to one plus higher order terms and F of T, uh, F of minus T is equal to one. So if you use this map, you get isomorphisms when you uh, localize it to, whereas the usual term character you have to localize up to the dimension, uh, to all numbers up to the dimension of your space because of these factorials in the denominator. Um, so this uh, isomorphism seems to play well with equivariant vector bundles. It maps them to uh, much nicer combinatorial expressions in the cohomology ring that lets us do computations which extend June Hu's computations of log concavity statements for matroids. We can kind of generalize that to these things called delta matroids, which are basically matroids for other Coxeter types. And then the last thing is that, so in types B, C, and D, there's just, you can do the same trick. And in type B, there's a very weird thing you can do, which gives you an integral isomorphism. But I have to be very careful about what I mean by something in type B. It's a little bit technical, but basically it applies to any flag variety. So SO2N plus one mod P, and it applies to toric varieties. Well, I guess I wrote it up here. Um, here, it applies to type B flag varieties. It also applies to toric varieties, which are between the type B permutahedral toric variety and P1 to the N, which is the toric variety for the Q. So there's like some weird extra condition we can put on the graph of this GKM graph, which allows us to be, to like really manually construct a truly horrible isomorphism on the equivariant level that seems to descend to the correct thing non-equivariantly. It has very nice formal properties and it makes the combinatorics work out great. So that's my hour. Um, if anyone has any questions, I can go into anything or say anything. That's great. Well, thank, thanks a lot, Hunter. We can now unmute ourselves and thank Hunter for a great talk.